Good morning, everybody. Um, so I think it was a fantastic introduction. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is about Intuit's uh, journey, she was saying, from essentially from a, um, what I would say is a basic software company into a design thinking organization now looking to be design, uh, design driven. And the, the scaffolding for this talk I'm going to use today is essentially two articles. Uh, the first one is from our CEO who, in Harvard Business Review a few months back, uh, did an article about being what it means to lead a design driven uh, company and on that journey. And the second is actually from DMI. So a few years back, they did uh, uh, a study on a design, as they call it, design conscious. We call it design driven companies. And sort of the, the what I would say, the aspects, uh, attributes of companies that are considered design driven, and then plotted those against the S&P 500 and looked how they're actually doing. Um, so these are the attributes uh, that they brought to bear, and these are the attributes that I'll be uh, looking at today. So design leadership, so there's senior uh, leadership within the company, within design, there's growth, there's investment in design, the scale of design itself is integrated into the company, there's a commitment at the senior level, and the last one is organizational structure, design is actually embedded within the company. Uh, so we'll talk about how we've kind of moved through uh, gaining those attributes. And sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, give you the punchline right now. The idea here is uh, Design-driven companies outpace the S&P 500, and you can see down here uh, at the bottom, this is the S&P over the past nine-ish, ten years, has, riven, has gone up to 77%. That's our stock price, Intuits. It's at 357% uh, growth at this point over the course of nine years. The red dot denotes where our new CEO came on board and declared that we would then move away from being an operational company and move towards being design-driven. So the evidence is, is, uh, uh, is well-founded here. And we were just talking earlier that they're doing another uh, survey again, looking at the index. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a designer for a long time. This was my original internship with Gutenberg. This is me in the background there. Uh, so actually, I started my career as a graphic designer. I moved into digital design over time, uh, being a creative director for Wells Fargo Bank in the United States is one of the top four or five banks there. Worked at Yahoo, uh, leading their global division, and then came to Intuit to work on both the design thinking practice and design strategy practice. It's a little bit about me. So Intuit, the company I work for, uh, it's based in Silicon Valley. Uh, as I always say, if you know where Google is, we're down the road from, from Google. No one ever says it the other way. Do you know where Intuit is? Google's down the street from it. Uh, a lot of what they talk about the products that we have is they are not desired, they are needed products. So our products are essentially accounting-based um, and tax-based. So if you're a small business in the United States, it is, it is pretty safe to assume that you use QuickBooks to run your accounting. If you do your taxes in the United States, you're responsible for your own taxes. And finally, TurboTax is a digital way of doing it. You probably use one of our products that way. Mint is a personal finance and Quicken is a personal finance uh, product as well. Now, a lot of times, um, people ask me about, you know, why would you work for a company that actually deals with accounting? That sounds, um, that sounds pretty uh, dry. But at least if you've ever spoken to anyone about a small business owner and their money, it's highly emotional. If you've ever talked to anyone in the United States, I'm sure it's the same here in Europe, about their taxes, highly emotional. So I think, in a sense, the product is boring. The subject and the customer is insanely engaging and endlessly interesting. So if you are customer-centric and customer-backed, it is probably one of the most rich uh, areas I've ever worked in. So here's, uh, here's a little bit of a kind of a fast-forward history of us. With Intuit, founded in 1983, IPO'd 93, uh, sorry, founded in 83, IPO'd 93, uh, 8,000 employees, 32 countries, 4.5 uh, 4 billion revenue, and uh, 50 million customers worldwide. That's a little bit of sense about who, who we are. Okay, so here, let's jump into the talk. Chapter one, so uh, it's a four chapter, uh, four chapter talk. I tried to get it to three, I couldn't, so it's four chapters, it's a little awkward, uh, but we'll jump in anyway. So ease of use, chapter one. So before I jump in, so this is Peter Drucker, sort of known as the kind of um, godfather of modern management theory, uh, and here's a quote, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, He's famous for a lot of things. I think this one's pretty interesting. So why would he say something like that? Well, culture shapes patterns of beliefs, feelings, adaptation, which people carry in their minds, and drives behavior. 
So we think about corporate cultures, it's about behavior. And here was the behaviors at Intuit in roughly the early 90s. This is essentially a design review. Right? It's spreadsheets, and what you found at that time is then what happens with spreadsheet ways of designing things is you end up getting feature bloat. And now we have a company that based itself on its first 10 years were all about ease of use. Apps, it was about ease of use. But now if you're running a company off of spreadsheets, what happens is ease of use starts to go out the window. Right? You get these box softwares that have you know, 50 or 60 features on the back of it. And what was also occurring at that, po at that point in time, roughly 2000, is that ease of use became table stakes. Everyone had a usability lab or could get a, a access to a usability lab in digital design. Uh, and you could bring someone and you could kind of figure out what was going wrong with your product. But what happened though, at that same time, because it became a, a sort of a commodity, ease of use was a commodity, uh, we measured our products by net promoter. And net promoter is on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this product to someone else? And that was the, that was the number that we measured, right, was net promoter. Would someone tell someone else about the product? This number starts crashing because ease of use is starting to go out, of, out, out the window. At the same time, as you might imagine, our stock price now starts to flatten because people aren't telling other people about our, our products. So uh, we'll take a pause here for a second. We'll look at the attributes of a design-driven company. And we roughly have one at this point in time, the organizational structure. We had design in the company. They were designers. The design management was a little wonky. I think there was no one really higher up than maybe a design manager within the corporation. Or they reported into marketing or engineering. It was sort of catch as can can going on there. So chapter two, belief. So this is about the time when the CEO changed. This is Brad Smith, our current CEO. And he declared at that time that we were going to become a premier innovative growth company. And at the time, he said, look, by 2015, I want to see the stock price up to 75. And at that time, the stock was roughly at maybe 28. It seemed like the most preposterous thing I'd ever seen in my life. Right? It just did not seem attainable in any way, shape, or form. But what he had, he had, um, but what he had, uh, had come before him, the previous CEO, was um, a gentleman who used to report to Jack Welsh, the head of GE. And if you know anything about GE, during those time under Jack Welsh, it was all about operational excellence. So he inherited an incredibly, and it was needed at the time, an incredibly operationally excellent software company. But if you can imagine, operational excellence in software is only going to get you so far. And so that's why he went on to move on to say we need to become much more of an innovative company. So he declares this, premier innovative growth company. So what are we going to do? How are we going to change? Well, we have to move from ease of use to something else. And what we moved to the something else was we're going to delight our customers. We're going to move towards delight. I think it's sort of a, an overused phrase at this point in time, but it was sort of just getting that, that uh, was just starting to crack through during this period of time. So delight was now being declared. We were going to delight our customers. And if you're going to delight your customers, if you're going to delight your customers, there it is. You have to do something. How are you going to get there? We have designed for it. So the program we started was called Design for Delight in the company. That was going to be the change mechanism. And this is how we defined it, going beyond customer expectation and delivering ease and benefit, evoking positive emotion through the customer journey. That is a mouthful and very difficult to tell over and over again to an organization, I, I assure you. The three things to be called out, though, is that we've still got ease in here. These are the measures. How are we going to understand if we're delighting our customers? Well, there's ease. I can't go away. Customer benefit has to be very clear what the customer benefit is. And the last piece is emotion. We're going to bring emotion into it. Um, but more importantly, I think the piece that's come through um, is this idea of throughout the customer journey, which means end to end, designing end to end, complete, not thinking about things as individual touch points that don't connect back and forth to each other. It's a complete end to end experience. Customers experience your products seamlessly through and don't consider the org structure about who's dealing with what piece of it. And that was one of the pieces that we had to deal with. So this is how we rolled it out. You have to remember the context, the culture at that time was one that uh, thrived on, uh, on excellence of, of uh, being operationally sound. 
So of course, this is how you're going to innovate, right? Here are the steps, here are the processes, and it was rejected out of hand by the organization. There were lots of PowerPoint presentations and nothing happened. And so what we did was, at that time, uh, we started getting uh, religion on design thinking. We started integrating in with the, the, the D School out of Stanford in Palo Alto. Uh, and instead of having a process, what we came away was, we took the three essential bits of design thinking, and we said, we're going to have principles. We're not going to have process, we're going to have principles. Because you have principles, people feel empowered. And they can take those, and they can know at least how to do their work, uh, not in a linear fashion, but at least know what's going to guide them. So deep customer empathy, knowing your customer better than they know themselves, is how we, we talked about it. Rapid experimentation, rapid iteration, and this idea of divergent and convergent um, uh, thinking. So how we started this program uh, to get this thing moving was myself and two other people. Um, and this is it. There's the three of us in this gigantic white ocean space that we had to deal with, which was the organization. So if you have principles, what's hard about principles is that you, know, you sort of have to embody them and show other people what they're like. You can't just tell them, be like this, right? So we had to be very much a teach the teacher and embed with teams and work with them. So the three of us then kind of got together with another nine folks, and we taught them what we knew, and we worked with them, and then we moved on from there, and those folks embedded and worked with other folks and continued to bring these principles to bear and understand what they meant for <laughs> our company. And one of the things that we, really, uh, we understood and realized is that companies are not hierarchies. Truly at their core, if you think about them, they're networks. They're networks like any place else. And so we, we, uh, we leaned into quite a bit into this idea of that companies are networks. Because what we were after in the end is that we wanted this program, we wanted these principles designed for delight in the DNA of the company. Because remember, we're trying to shift behavior. So we want to be in the DNA. That's when we said we would be done, which is sort of abstract, but it was sort of putting this, this vision out in front of us that we felt on some level was almost unattainable. But it was the place that we wanted to go. The company had to have it in its DNA. And how you would do that is you had to make sure everyone cared and wanted to be part of design. And so any time that I would actually talk about uh, these new principles or design thinking at the company, I would start with a slide that was blank like this, and I would ask folks in the room, who's a designer in this room? Or who cares about designers in the room? Yes, I've got some, I've got two. I assume there was more in this room. Right, excellent. But I would be, I'd be in room with the folks from legal, finance, marketing, uh, operations, anyone. And then I would show this. And this used to really piss off the designers because they wanted to, this is very kind of, they wanted this. But everyone designed who devises a course of action aimed at changing existing situations to preferred ones. At that point, I would say, who, who is a designer in the room? And every hand would go up. And I would say, you can embrace these principles if you, say, if you have this desire. And here's an example of this. So that's Phil in the background. He's in customer care out in Tucson, Arizona, far away from headquarters. Uh, he, run the, he ran the, 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 the phone operations, the customer care. And if you can see in the back walls, we had, I think, things that are very common to us now, but uh, storyboards. And you can see all the stickies. We brought customers in to meet with the, phone, uh, with the phone folks in person, and then they acted out the roles that they had to actually deal with on the phone. The customers gave feedback. Now, this, now Phil had never in, an, in his entire career thought about engaging customers at this level. And this is what we thought about, right? We wanted to make sure that we could give this away to anyone and everyone who wanted to actually deal with design and improving it. And again, this starts to get to that idea of throughout the customer journey, so thinking end to end, applying design end to end across the company. We also did this with executives as well. So we went up and down the, uh, the chain of command. At a certain point in time, Intuit was a little slow getting into the mobile game. game. So we actually, uh, for these folks, we wanted to break through the PowerPoint and get them active. So we actually gave them all phones as part of a leadership conference. And to get to dinner in the evening, they had to run through a scavenger hunt in San Francisco using every aspect of the phone to get there. So again, we were sort of breaking down the walls about uh, who could actually engage uh, with design and um, uh, be much more active in the process. 
we got to a point, this is about four or five years in now, we got to a point within the, the company that it was really, um, it was starting to be seen in design thinking and the capabilities of design thinking as a core asset, a core capability. So much so that we actually started using it out in the community. Uh, we have a thing called uh, We Care and Give Back, which is our ability to go out. We all have 40 hours a year to go and work with any nonprofit we want uh, uh, around the world. And uh, here's a, a snippet. From Citizen that. Schools is a national not-for-profit that partners with low-income middle schools to create an expanded learning day. After school, we bring in citizen teachers, engineers from Intuit, marketing people from Google, lawyers, doctors, who dedicate 10 weeks to teaching an apprenticeship in our school. So once a week, they come and they teach something they love. So this is an opportunity to work together. We taught for 10 weeks. It was myself and four other people here at Intuit. And the highlight of it for me was a teacher came by and said, since he started this apprenticeship, he has actually come out of his shell. He's talking more. His, he's reading better. And he's actually raising his hand and taking the chance to answer questions that he wasn't doing before this apprenticeship. And so today here at Intuit, you can see some of the product of this 10 weeks of work. There's robotics, there's design thinking. Oh, it's very good. The projects are really, really impressive. There is a team that actually built out an Android app. If you're too lazy to go to the counter, you can go like, I have an app for this. And then it notifies the chef. He goes like, oh my god, I need to make this pizza. They walk in this bright, shiny building and they see all this cool stuff and they're like, this is cool. And it gives them inspiration to keep going. I mastered this. Me, my partner Angel, and Eddie Berto. Right. You think you'd ever work in a place like this? I think I would. So you can see how now this, this, uh, this kind of thought about giving it away, right, that everyone designs is now a belief in the system, right? It's a belief within the company, so much so that they go out and actually use it uh, in the community itself. And what was going on now, so this kind of closes off this chapter with design thinking, uh, customer interactions are up about 140% at this point in time. That's a general manager um, of our global division meeting with a customer uh, there. Uh, products are starting to shift and change. This is a product that uh, you can actually use your phone uh, and use the OCR to do your taxes on it. You could do your taxes in roughly 15 minutes, which is sort of unheard of uh, in the tax industry. Our stock is up about 120% about the end of this chapter, and Forbes, we, we break the uh, Forbes 100 in terms of most innovative companies. So things are starting to change, right? It's starting to feel better uh, at this point. So let's take a look at our, our attributes and our factors in being a design-driven company. And you'd think we'd be a little bit more, but still, this is sort of design at the organizational level, right? So there's growth. There's investment in design at this point in time. But structurally, we're still not there. We're still, not, uh, we're still not happening. OK, so chapter three. This is focus. So like I said, what we've been doing is going across the organization, right? Legal, finance, operations, as I was mentioning, right? And we've, we've looked to change the entire behavior of the company, because what we actually really understood was the context of which design can thrive has to be kind of robust, and everyone has to understand the language, the capabilities, how we're going to go and do it. That's how, that was our belief. And now we're roughly five years into it at this point in time. So we say, well, this now, we've got to go deep. Deep into the product, deep into actual design organization itself. And so our CEO, at this time, says, hey, I love the activity. This is really working out well. But man, our products just aren't that much better. They're really not. They're improving, but we're not seeing a great shift. So he had everyone on his staff. This is the C-level staff. Again, very, not just the general managers of the product groups, but the head of HR, the head of legal, et cetera. And they all went out. And these are the companies they went out to. And they shattered either the CEO or the head of product. And they shattered them for two days. And they went through all the design reviews and everything they did. Into it, I should kind of back up, is very much steeped in ethnography. So this is just natural for us to want to go out and kind of observe people. Not have an interview, but actually observe them. So they went out to all these companies, um, and they came back after these two days, and they found out two things. And these are going to sound very obvious at this point. 
And one is, boy, I didn't see much PowerPoint in these design reviews. And then they looked at people's calendars. And when they looked at people's calendars, what they found out is most of these leaders were spending their time in design reviews or with designers. When they looked at their own calendars, they found themselves in lots of meetings about kind of marketing or the legal or the parts of the components of running a business. But more profoundly, what they found is that they were living in the product itself. Product reviews were happening on devices, in the rooms, in working prototype fashion. Again, I know this sounds probably obvious to everyone here in this room, but it was like a revelation that people came back and said, they don't use PowerPoint to do reviews. You know? This to a design organization who had, been, who had been kind of trying to push towards this kind of working model of rapid iteration with prototypes was sort of music to our ears. But now became the question, now you've got these C-level group of folks who say, you know, wow, we have to change. We really have to change. This is amazing. But I don't know how to do it, right? I have an MBA, or, I've got, or my background is in some kind of business ops, et cetera. How am I going to do this? And this is now where the design leadership started to, to happen within the company. And as I had mentioned before, design, oh, I gave away the punchline. The, uh, Design reported into sort of multiple places within the organization and multiple levels. And so when a, when a leader of a business unit would say, hey, I want to do a design review, they'd have to either kind of invite bunches of people that didn't seem to line up very well. And so what we worked very hard on at that point was to get design leadership at the right level, at, uh, reporting into the, to the general managers. And how we did this was, I didn't do this, my former boss, Karen Hansen, did it, and it was brilliant. She went back to those companies that they shadowed, and she looked at the ratios of designers to engineers to product managers. And what she found out in most organizations that you saw on that board was that at least product management to design, for us, it was roughly three product managers to one designer, and those other companies, it was flipped. It was usually two or three designers to one product manager. And design management, design leadership, all reported directly into, the, into either the CEO or the head of product. So, we moved things and we flattened it out. And we got folks up into those, into those areas. And again, I'm gonna kind of bring this home in an end-to-end -end manner, manner. So within customer care, they reported it up and in. Within the product, up and in, right? So we actually had design leadership throughout what we would call throughout the customer journey, the customer touch points. And one other thing that's happened is now we've got design leadership reporting at the highest level. And now we took some time um, to say, OK, what is this capability we have in terms of design? And so this is how we think about uh, the capabilities of the designer, right? the person whose function is design. Um, and my colleague Armando actually came up with this framework um, uh, for us. But more importantly, you saw the top was craft. Well, you have to assume that you can, you can find craft. You can find that expertise. But what we needed as an organization in terms of design was influence and knowledge. So we now then started looking into uh, trainings um, and courses for the designers, whether that's interaction, visual, prototyping, et cetera, to look at both influence and knowledge uh, to actually make the product come forward. All right, let's come back to our, to our framework and how we're we doing now. Ah, we're moving on a little bit. Now we're probably year seven-ish. Right, so design leadership is in place. We actually have the design leadership pushing there. We still have a couple more to go, uh, but we will not be deterred. Uh, so chapter four, impact. Uh, with that amount of leadership in place, everyone looking at the product, what occurred to everyone at that time is there was no vision for these products. We were just still operationalizing them. We were still just, almost to a certain degree, still thinking about ease of use. Even with all this stuff in place, we thought about delight quite a bit, don't get me wrong. Right? But we said, delight in terms of what? Where is it going? And so it was a moment of pause for most uh, folks to say, these products all need uh, some type of, of vision. And if they're going to be a vision, they need to be based on people, not based on what the product is about, but what our customers are trying to achieve in their lives. So as we did this, we started looking at some of the information that we had around as we started to prepare these visions for products that we had. 
And when I spoke to a bunch of the heads of design, the VPs and directors of design at Intuit before I came here for this trip, uh, this kept coming back over and over uh, again for me, and none of them had talked to each other, and I thought it was sort of fascinating, was that they all said when they were looking to create these new product visions for the next five to 10 years out uh, for themselves, most folks said, hey, look, this company's been around for close to 25, 30 years. Everything we need to know about our company, or our, sorry, our customer, is here. We've got stacks of PowerPoint decks everywhere. I mean, we have done so much research. No one needs to go out and do anything. And what they all said is, well, we had a lot of knowledge, but we had no belief. And I love this quote, I'd rather believe in three things about my customers than no 50. And it's very true. I mean, if you think about any of the products or services that you work on, when you believe something about the customer, that your ability to design better, I think is just at a tectonic level. I mean, it's so much far advanced. And so we started doing this product by product, each group. This is QuickBooks. Again, this is a small business accounting product. Their vision is the upper hand corner says make accounting invisible. What we understand is that, and I think there's a lot of small business owners in here today, no one got in business to do their books or their accounting. And so we want to get it out of the way. The vision for the product is to become invisible because we know customer back, that's what they're looking for. The next one is Mint, which is a personal finance application. Theirs is to build hope through everyday financial triumphs. So this one, just, just to me, just is seeped in customer back vision, right? This idea of really thinking about, being very practical about this. It used to be, you know, this isn't about saving for your home or a car. This is about the everyday things that people are trying to accomplish in their lives financially. Then finally, for TurboTax, which is the, the tax software that we have, which is make, make tax prep obsolete. Again, it's not about the product, right? The product is actually saying we want to recede and just give the benefits that the people want and get out of the way, right? That to me is clearly a customer back type of vision. And I'll talk a little bit more deeply about TurboTax and how, about, how they went about theirs. Uh, again, this was a group that said we have enough data and contextual inquiry or ethnography to, to, drown, uh, to drown a business. But instead what they said, they were gonna do something different this time. And so what they did was they got one small team, about six folks. This time it was led by design. It was a cross-functional team. Product was there, marketing was there, um, engineering was there. Complete function, cross-function, but it was led by design. But they did something different this time. They, they took all the employees and they engaged them, 600 employees. When this vision was just about to start, get kicked off, set the context, uh, growth had been relatively flat for TurboTax over the past for five years. They'd gotten a new general manager who said, we need to reboot this organization and we need to reboot the, 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 the product itself. So they engaged 600 employees in this vision. And those folks were all responsible for bringing back two stories from, from people, not just customers of TurboTax, but people, anyone. Because the subject is essentially their personal finances or taxes, both very emotional, uh, both very emotional um, subjects. And they were, their end point was to come up with one vision. And how they did this is they took all 600 employees of this division, they put them on buses down in San Diego in California, Southern California, and they sent them off to different neighborhoods uh, around uh, San Diego. If you've been there, it's, ma it's a massive county in, in, in the United States. And each of them were responsible for just going out. They had a script that they were gonna kind of reference as they went out, and they just talked to people about their finances. And most people were petrified. You imagine you've got uh, some, some folks that are gonna pick on engineers that have been you know, living deep down in the stack, haven't you know, come out of their cube in years, right? We're actually now out talking to customers. And what was fascinating, for a company that is so customer-centric, how many people actually hadn't talked to a customer? They've been building this product for years, and it never, I mean, they never talked to anyone. I mean, they might talk to friends or family who tell them about a glitch, you know what I mean, like this isn't working, et cetera, but hadn't really just gone out and talked to people about their finances, and what they all came back and said was, I went into a Starbucks and sat down and just said, hey, I'm from TurboTax, do you want to talk, I'd love to talk to you just about your finances, and people just opened up. I don't know if it's an American thing, but anyway, everyone just opened up. And all 600 of them, all 600 of them came back with, with two stories. They all had two stories. And they brought them back and they debriefed it. They debriefed all these stories that they had heard. And they had all these common themes that 
the themes that we're running through, all the stuff that we, that we think about, right? Uh, finances are difficult. Um, managing feels like a tightrope. Uh, for TurboTax with the United States, or with taxes in the United States, for 60% of Americans, it's the largest paycheck they'll get all year. The single largest paycheck. And people count on it. They wait for it. And this is a, this is a big deal. People decide whether they're going to buy a car, whether they're going to go on a vacation, whether their kids are going to get X kind of clothes. I mean, they are really thinking about this check. So it's important to them. And so now they produce the vision. The vision then has to go up to the CEO and the staff. And this is the note that the GM, Sasan Ghazadi, uh, brought forth. So he says, look, I walked them through the logic that led to our decision with the upfront pitches so they experienced the emotion. And now we have the entire company's leadership behind us. The most important piece in here is now you've got a GM leading with emotion. Leading his product and his organization with emotion of the customer. And he's in. And the CEO's in. And all the staff is in on this. Because they're going to reboot this product line and they're going to reboot it on uh, the fact that it's going to be emotional. And all these stories came back. This is the uh, cafeteria of the TurboTax uh, campus. And all these stories got codified. And the folks that they spoke to they went out and did photo shoots and brought them all in so that they would always remember those stories that they, that they told. And what I actually have now is, uh, if you do this, if you lead with emotion, if you get everyone involved this way, now it opens up the aperture for what you can do as design. Right? You have much bigger berth about doing more interesting things. I'm going to show you a film right now about how the design team actually wanted to create a series of experiments uh, to learn more about uh, customers and customers' interaction with taxes. And so what they did was they created a storefront in San Diego where they could run multiple experiments through and also just engage folks. And this is a little short film on it. Discovery is all about humility, it's all about empathy, and it's all about the humanism and that approach that is completely outside in. And it's completely repaying respect to people and their needs and wants in the ultimate, like, humble servant manner, right? Everything we do is in service to people and to make their lives better and add value. Our team was specifically put together to try and figure out how could we serve people who don't want to do taxes themselves, and so people who we call delegators. That meant that we really needed to start out by understanding who are the people who we call delegators and thinking more narrowly and specifically about them. So we needed to figure out who those folks are and what do they really need. I walk around this neighborhood a lot when I just have some free time. My mom kind of mentioned it to me that it was time to do taxes and I was well aware of it. I was scared of it. I like to just kind of look in the stores and see what's in the area. There was one day where they're passing out flyers around here. I thought it was really nicely decorated. I like the color scheme. So I just came in. I just want to give it a chance. You know, I just want to give something new and something different compared to the other um, hundreds and thousands of other companies. It was a local place so I just thought I just like to kind of, you know, support local business. I used to do my taxes on TurboTax, but, you know, with the changes going on, I decided to come here. You know, we've come upon some really big and important understandings for our team, which say that for some people, they need people. It was important to me because face-to-face um, -face interaction is everything, uh, especially the first interaction, the handshake, the, you know, the face interaction. Uh, the eye contact. I mean, it's nice to just know that there's somebody who has the background, who's professional, who is nice and making you feel comfortable, and you can just kind of say, okay, here's, just do this, please. I don't know what I'm doing. The people-to-people -people contact, it becomes about trust, it becomes about relationships, and sometimes even uh, about friendship for people. So it goes well beyond just getting your taxes done. Meeting people where they are is the most humble way to, to of course, get the knowledge of what people or like. Oh, my mother lost her job last year, so I took it upon myself to support my mother and my two younger siblings. People have routines. They have 
timing in their life. They have rushes. Um, I understood the complexity of that situation. Um, had two jobs, so um, I needed to become more independent. They have pain and stress and they have joy and opportunity and desires, right? Moving to a new city on my own and being able to find a job and be successful. So people have a lot of things going on in their lives. That's just kind of been something that's made me really happy because my parents tell me that they're proud a lot that I've been able to do that. By meeting them where they are, you fit into their life in a much more natural manner. Emotion is not measured by numbers and values. It's measured by emotion and feeling and attributes. I was feeling overwhelmed. Uh, my mom didn't want me to take that responsibility upon myself. She wanted to figure it out herself. But as the eldest, I knew that I had to do it, you know, and I had no problem doing it. As, as soon as I moved to California, I broke my arm in three places <laughs> the first week that I started my job, and I couldn't do a whole lot. My mom was a janitor for Sharpie Steely Hospital, so she worked the graveyard shift, and uh, she would always ask me if I could come and help her out. So I was still in high school when she'd asked me, but I'd had no problem helping out as well. Unfortunately, things happened, push came to shove, and she was uh, laid off. For me, I'll look at it from an outside and an inside perspective. From an outside perspective, I believe that we have stories that will, when we look at those stories and we've listened to those stories and documented those stories, those stories are gonna help us internally drive em emotional design and emotional products into the hands and hearts of consumers. So that was that. That's the VP of Design who was speaking there, uh, Kurt Wallachie. He used to be the head of design over at Nokia for a while. So you can see how story and in, engaging with customers it just says it there, right? It's actually what's going to drive them uh, forward. So, all right, we're almost there, right? So where are we now in our journey? We're about nine years in, and we certainly have commitment from the most senior levels in the company. Uh, and the scale of design is integrated, and it's truly a catalyst uh, for change. And so, in conclusion, kind of the big learnings that I've come away with over this period of time is that uh, it's design-driven over designer-driven. Right? Design is something that the entire organization has to take on, and it's not owned by the function or the names of the word design, designer, right? It's, uh, everyone, everyone has to be involved with it. The second one is belief over knowledge. You can just see from that video there, right, that, that sense of belief in the stories of, of all those people is what's going to actually drive folks forward, not some statistical knowledge. Not to say that we don't use metrics, we do. I mean, absolutely essential, right? But if you're going to make products that are emotionally engaging, belief is essential. And the last one is end to end. The experience has to be completely considered from every touch point in a, in a way that our customers um, deal with it. And with that, I say thanks. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have time for. Is there time left? We have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions? For Melissa Nova from, from here on. Hi. Thank you, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, we uh, help organisations do the same journey that you've just spoken about. One question that I have is when an organisation is still at the beginning of the journey where the understanding of the value of design is still quite immature, yeah. how do you justify the upfront investment in the decisions to get people on buses and to yeah. go out there? And well, the bus stuff that? can be later, just to be clear sure. about that. Um, you know, that's really great you brought that up. So someone had said to me once, uh, I'll tell this uh, via, I'm Irish, I have to tell via a story, right? So um, I was in this person's office one day, and uh, this was actually a pivotal moment for the beginning of the process. And this woman had all, every single trophy that you could win at our company, like the CEO award and the on-time award. And she had every award, right, for this thing. And I don't know what you think about awards, but anyway, she had awards. And I said to her, I go, how did you get all of that stuff, right? I mean, she had a complete trophy case. And she said, I've never started a project on my own. I look for other projects that are moving, and I jump on them. And I say, how can I help you? And when she said that to me, I thought, that's it. And so what we did in the very beginning is we have a thing called 10% time. Uh, started way back by IBM. Uh, we have 10% to do anything. So that initial innovation catalyst, those folks that helped other people at the beginning, 
we leveraged the 10% time. And we said, you have 10% time to do anything, so we leveraged that. Um, they would have things like jam sessions where people would come together. We'd facilitate those. Anything that was already moving, we would jump on board. And so we never had to really justify the cost from it, many things, other than maybe sticky notes and, and, mark and, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, we never looked to upbring it. We jumped on board. So I would say jump on a moving train, and uh, that was our philosophy at the beginning. One more question. Thanks. Hi, Sandra Barraclough from GSK. Obviously, it's taken you several years. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about seven, eight years. If you were to do the journey again, how would you do it in 30% of the time? <laughs> what are you, product manager? <laughs> uh, what would I do differently? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, boy, I don't, this is going to sound bad. I don't know if I'd do anything differently. I really don't. I mean, I think the thing is you've got to stumble your way through this. There's no, I don't know if there was anything. If I took away one roadblock that I think we had, I know I would just bang into a different one. Right? It's just sort of ripe with peril is this process and this journey. Um, I don't know if I would change anything. I don't know if I would change a thing. Okay, Joseph, thank you very much. Thanks. Let's uh, show our appreciation.